All right, welcome back. This is WUB, Wake Up Belize Morning Vibes, and we won't waste any time. We will go right into our conversation uh, with our brother, Jeremy Enriquez, and uh, he's coming across to us likewise, like uh, our previous guest on Skype. And uh, welcome, brother Jeremy. Good morning, Yuri. Yeah, welcome, my brother. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to jump right into it. Since you've been here with us before, uh, you know the routine. Um, we want to ask you if you could share with our audience uh, the concept, firstly, of um, wellness, its purpose, some examples of how does it relate to the challenges that we're facing, not only during this stressful time of COVID, but as a lifestyle practice, as you have so done so well in your Facebook, in your presentations, and even when you were here with us uh, some months ago. Uh, first, I want to thank you very much for having me, and um, definitely I'm glad to return to talk about some aspects of wellness, mainly uh, mental health. This is, um, I understand, Mental Health Month, but I want to lay some points very clearly first, just to start with, and um, if this could be a take home, if people forget everything else that I say, I want to put a few points up front, that even before a child is born, right within the womb, that child is impregnated with conditions of the parents and the consciousness of the parents so right from the womb so whatever the mother does during those nine months is going to have lifelong impact on the child for better or for worse so this is appealing then to mothers to take care of themselves, to really take care and be sensitive. Everything you do, if you if you are doing anything that is destructive to yourself, then you are passing on some information in the consciousness of your future generation. So, um, drinking, smoking, cursing, anger, all of these things, especially when that child is in the womb, is born to have an impact on the child. So that's the first thing. But the fathers cannot get away also because how that father treats that mother and the kinds of um, emotional conditions that are around is also going to affect that child. So that's the first formative condition of the child. When that child comes out into society, um, within the family, if there is a lot of, again, negative energies, that child is born to be impacted emotionally, sometimes lifelong scars. Um, if there is positive energy, then also um, that child will be positively impacted. So I want that to be set out as a foundation for a lot of habit patterns that keep recycling itself and make us wonder why are we like this and sometimes we're recycling, recycling the same mindset, habit patterns that could be destructive and continue down to generations. So we have to be very careful uh, of first to take care of ourselves. Um, second thing. Can I, can I stop you for just a second yes. there? Because really what you're saying is that certainly when you were in the womb, you had no active consciousness of how your parents were behaving but when you are 17 18 years old and you're going on away you may not even make the connection that some of that is in my dna if i if i if, if yes I in the formative area that's what yeah. we tend to look at dna just as a physical thing so people could say well you're alcoholic because maybe um there are these conditions in your in your past um not just from you we are you're passing down parents are passing on everything about themselves into these tiny genes but also on um, the emotional state um our level of um of, of viewing of the way in which we view and respond to life 
all of these are also has its formation right within the womb. But it does not mean that that cannot change. So that's why I say the second step is how children are treated within their families and then at school and in the broader society, there are constant external pressures that could be brought to bear on the individual and it will affect how, what kinds of patterns of life one takes on. And there has to be a conscious effort to make changes from within committed, dedicated effort. The second point I want to point uh, to look at is Belize has a high rate, in fact, one of the highest in all of the Americas, of diabetes. And unfortunately, we're not looking at some of the root cause. So while we recognize that there is this high level of diabetes, an increasing level of diabetes, right within the schools, and many schools are selling soft drinks to their students, they're selling um, all kinds of unhealthy food. And so what are we teaching or what are we preparing this young generation um, to do towards change? So it's almost like it is accepted that, yes, we have high levels of diabetes, but at the root level, as we're nurturing a new generation, there seems no committed effort to make the kinds of changes that are necessary to make um, profound impact on our national health consciousness. And so I am saying this as a strong appeal to principals of schools. You are the leaders of the school. You cannot be investing time to perpetuate old condition, bad habits, that is having long-term effects on our um, national health. And of course, doctors are, are, are not as aggressive also because of, of the tend to prescribe medicines when the illness is already there, but we need to look at prevention. So I, kind of, I call it a kind of a mindlessness for us to constantly do the things that are counterproductive and in the end, we're creating a sickness. And likewise, we have uh, heart disease is another um, big health issue in Belize. Um, so diabetes, uh, heart disease, and there's also HIV. There are other lifestyle diseases that could be that changes could be made towards creating a health. So we need to look at what foundations we are setting up in order to build a healthiest. Otherwise, we we talk over and over. We do all these walks and we. Uh, we do all the um, diabetes walks and the different kinds of things, but we're not aggressively addressing it at the root. So my first appeal is to the prince. I remember years ago, I went to a school and I asked the principal and the teachers to please look at this. Uh, this is a high school in Toledo district. For 10 years, I'm saying, please, you're... And I did this because there was a cousin of mine who was hospitalized with some kidney problems, and the doctor said, you're, you're taking too much soft drink. You need to take more water. And she came out of the hospital. And I also scolded her, and I said, you, you, you've got to change. But she goes back to school, and there is the soft drink that she is addicted to. And she said, but it's at school. They sell this, and I have no. And therefore, my initiative to come to, to check with the school and say, listen, you need to be an institution that is preparing our young minds for a different, for, for nurture different healthy habits instead of perpetuating the same. Alcoholism is another problem, high levels of alcoholism. Um, but then you have advertisements targeting young people to drink. Um, and then for us, it's like nothing. And so we're perpetuating, we know the end result, but at the at the beginning and the root level, we're not, we're hardly doing anything to address it. So we complain, yeah, there is alcoholism, but then there's heavy marketing, targeting youth and women, young women. I mentioned before what women do to themselves will eventually and could harm their unborn child and the born child later on in life. So sowing those seeds of change is very important. So um, I just wanted to lay that those kinds of groundwork. So we've heard it all from various expertise, the importance of 
eating well, uh, uh, very um, nutritious foods, um, preferably, and the more people are seeing the value of plant-based diets, um, too much meat, especially those meat that are loaded, loaded with, with vaccines, hormones, antibiotics, has become popular in the Belizean diet, and it will have consequences. So plant-based diet, personally, I haven't eaten meat for over 30 years, so I have a bias. Um, freeing oneself from intoxicants, uh, cigarettes. We know the, the effects of cigarette smoking, yet young boys are given cigarettes and alcohol as a kind of a sign of manhood, um, but really destroying themselves. And so being able to abstain from intoxicants. Um, the importance of exercise, intermittent fasting, to be able to have, get the body cleansed, all of those things are studied and are uh, part of physical health. And I'll talk about mental right. health and the mind shortly. Uh, you were Thank about you. to go from uh, the impact of when we are born, what happens in our, secondly, what happens in our home environment, and now you've gone on to habits that the society in general accepts, such as drinking of sweets, uh, alcohol, other intoxicants, and how that also impacts on people's behavior and prevents their wellness. Can you continue along that line? Uh, thank you, Nuri. Um, earlier, I, when I mentioned the impact of um, the child in the home and in the school and the community, I just wanted to caution that I, the people cannot end there and say, well, this is how it was for me, and therefore this is how my life will be. People can make conscious efforts and commitment and dedicated practice to change old habit patterns or ingrained patterns that they inherited from their past. Therefore, we cannot say, well, because my my parents had diabetes, well, I will have to just live with this and I have to continue. You have to examine what are the things that you continue to do that will lead to that end result. Um, you have to make conscious changes, changes in your diet, changes in your mind state, changes in your habit patterns um, in order to shift. But all of this is rooted in the per, a person's mind and consciousness. And therefore, uh, so everything starts with the mind. One of the things that are, what is, tend, I think is highly underrated or under, even I may use the term undermined, is the mind itself. The importance of the mind in our development. If we have negative mind states and we nurture that in hatred, greed, anger, negativity, we will get results even in our physical life and our bodies, our body stores, whatever is in the mind. So if we live with all of this, um, we create these negative um, tendencies. It is born to produce negative results. If we live with positivity, we live with clarity in our mind, um, in a way to handle the ups and downs of life, we will have a stronger mind to deal with situations as it happens. So, I want to talk a little bit about the habit patterns of the mind that is on train. <clears throat> One of the old habit patterns of the mind, that, and, I, and I talk about this in all my workshops, I've met teachers, I go around to different um, organizations, for them to think about what kind of energies are you producing to affect the lives of those you serve, teachers in the classroom, the kinds of organizational culture that we have, sometimes there's tension, there is stress, there is negativity, that is just based on a lot of anger, there's a fear, hatred, gossip, undermining of others, and these are unhealthy for the working environment and therefore will produce or will compromise the quality of work. Um, so one of these old habit patterns of the mind is greed. Greed is this 
in this kind of the mind is never satisfied it always wants and wants and wants and it creates a kind of a stress within a person's life you get a shoe you want shoe number 20 you're not happy until you get shoe number 21 you need this clothing you need this dress and all of life's energies are directed to acquiring material things want 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 or acquiring um, situations to massage the ego or a sense of power and that creates its own stressful energy because what people are looking for they're thinking that happiness is found outside of themselves and so they constantly are chasing for pleasure another drink another smoke another thing to get me high another uh, material thing because there's this constant insatiable greed and living their whole life chasing and chasing another of something and when they get it there's still that um, level of unhappiness um, not realizing that really as all thousands of years of wisdom has shown that happiness comes from within cultivating that peace of mind that balance of mind and then training the mind to achieve that state so it's not just saying peace and singing about peace and clapping to um, people who have achieved these great states of mind but doing the work to achieve a, a balance of mind for a happier life for a better state of being despite all the uh, there will be ups and downs of life there will be difficulties of life but once the mind is trained to say, well, this is not permanent, nothing in life is permanent, it is going to pass, and we rest with that thought, with patience, uh, even though it, it could be tremendous difficulties at the moment, your mind is balanced to say, well, this is also going to pass. So the greed, training your mind away from greed is one way. Secondly, of course, training your mind away from ignorance, which is another habit pattern of the mind, not even wanting to understand life locked in past beliefs, not willing to explore other ways of thinking and doing things, not being able to work to break out of that cycle that is conditioning people to do the same. So that is why sometimes people know for a fact, for example, sometimes that, you know, um, this drug, this alcohol, this cigarette, this is destroying me, but my mind is attached and weak and it is controlled by these external things. Um, because there's, although people have the intellectual academic knowledge about it, there is not the experienced wisdom to say, um, this is destroying me and my mind is strong enough to stop or if my mind is strong enough to make committed efforts towards change. I want to so those are old I want to stop you for a second so that we can yes. utilize as much of this limited time that we have. I want yes. you to speak now to a, a large sector of our people who are in the midst of additional stress. What you are saying to us in fact, relates to before COVID and after COVID. But right now, a lot of people are not even able to properly focus on what you're saying because of the immediacy of our situation, especially when it comes to economic survival. We are in a situation where we've learned of a man who committed suicide and some of the reports that came out <clears throat> said that he had been uh, charged with violating the curfew he had been charged uh, and he was looking at that five thousand even though he hadn't paid the five thousand he was looking at that five thousand dollar for breaking the rules he had recently been given notice by his landlord because he owed rent 
he was going from job to job when he eventually had the job that he had. I'm only going on the reports. I don't know the facts. I don't know the person. So I'm not speaking factually. I'm speaking more of a scenario that was painted about the stresses that he was going through. And I know other people who are going through similar stresses have not committed suicide, but maybe entertain that the way to deal with this is, guess what, I, I, I can't handle this. I just, I can't handle it. Bow. So yeah. speak to that sector of the population, please. Well, definitely. It's, um, these are very trying times, um, both difficult times for all of us. And lots of people are, are even finding that even the stress of putting food on the table daily for their children, um, the stress of not being able to pay the bills, and you're laid off quite well um, and in a kind of a, for that individual, what they might have gone through and more, the accumulation and the loss of hope that there's nothing else that life has to offer. It's a, how to do, I, I have to, let me mention that I also had a similar situation within my own family where uh, I lost a sister um, by suicide. Um, she, I thought this was uh, two, over two decades ago. At some point, she decided, she made a decision that situations in life was too much to handle and that this is the only way out. So what people are doing in those cases is to try to get rid of that intense pain and suffering in their life and somehow believing that that is the only way out and um, exercising that that um, decision that they make. Um, these things happen when people feel like there's no one else to reach out to. They're at the end of the line. And it is important that we nurture in our society, in our family, a supportive network for people to feel that I can go and talk to this person without judgment. And even though the problem might not be immediately solved, I have a new perspective of life. I have a new way to see that this is not the end of life. So even though the burden might feel so hard, even though it is difficult, I have a new strength to be able to bear this in a way that I know that this is not going to last forever. I will try to address this day by day. My life is more important than all the things that are externally challenging it. And we try to get within and find daily practice of calm, daily practice to nurture self within the mind to say to, to be able to say that this is not going to be permanent it is tough yes i'm faced with this situation i reach out to as many people as i can even when there is no support i will hold on to life because this is all i have this is all i have right now and i will work and this is all i have this is what i will need to work on and to hold on to be able to get over it. I cannot go over the challenges with no life, and, and ending this life is not the answer because the mind that we take in this life um, goes on to the next life, in a sense, if I may use that term, but nobody knows about that, but there's that belief in different faiths. Um, but again, no matter what, you tell yourself, no matter what, my life is valuable and you need to love yourself, you need to take care of yourself. Um, because if you don't take care of yourself, then you won't be able to take care of others. And if you don't take care of yourself, we can create these stories in our mind. And we build on these stories, oh, um, this is the worst thing that could happen. And you build on that story and, and that story that you have could consume you. When, when I, um, yes. One of the things also that we've seen uh, from a sort of uh, sociological uh, view of this is that uh, many people are living on the edge, contemplating suicide. And it is when they see somebody else does it, they say, 
I feel the same way. And so you have a pattern of maybe two or three suicides after that initial suicide. Can you comment on that? Yes, um, uh, there's tendency for others to see that as an out, that people can gain attention in ways that they did not get attention in life um, at their death. Um, and so people will, um, will tend to want to replicate that and say, well, look at all the attention a person has, look at, um, um, but it's not just about attention, but it provides a kind of a suggestion that this is a way out and the person is gone and all the problems of life is resolved. Um, but I would like to say very strongly that ending one's life due to all this accumulation of difficulties, which might be seen as a last resort, is not the way to go. People, you can find people who care you could just take a chance. Let them know that this is your plan. This is what you're going through. Take that chance. And I bet there will be not be anybody to say, well, oh, well, take away your life. Just go. I, I don't care. I will. People will have compassion when it comes to the crunch. So find those persons who could support you. Um, again, those stories could be powerful in your mind to say that, because of all these things, I cannot con uh, conquer. Maybe this gives you a chance also to find new connections, to find people who care, to, to let out, stop hiding these secrets. Let people know that this is what you're going through. In fact, many times we tend to hide these secrets and say, well, I am the only one going through this. It is overwhelming and it's hard. And you keep saying that and you withdraw instead find persons who could support you let out the secrets let them know um and it could give you a different perspective of life in your final comments to us can you describe some of the physical techniques uh, last time you were here you spoke about the breathing uh, yes. that one can use to de-stress and to uh, cool. And use that as your last comment, please. Well, I could I could lead you into a practice and um, just a short practice for for you to feel what a mindfulness technique is. Um, but I have to caution that sometimes people sit through these and, and expect instant result or quick result and say, huh, after two days I still don't feel this peace of mind in my life, and so they quit. It is just like physical practice, consistent practice, constant practice is going to yield tremendous results. I could say that with confidence because a lot of scientific studies have shown it. Um, I've trained a lot of people and they say, now I could sleep better after the practice. Um, I feel less stressed. My life is different. I know that it has done something for me. So I could lead you into a quick practice then. Are you ready, Nori? Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, you want uh, me to go away? Yeah, I want you to do it also. To, uh, um, uh, this is called the uh, awareness of body sensation. Uh, so it's basically just going through your body, feeling those areas of stress, and just releasing it and let it go. You're, you're, you're focusing on the awareness of your body and then you're releasing whatever stress you feel and just calmly relaxing. So I'll do it for you for a minute to close your eyes. And you at home could also practice. Um, sit with your back straight in the chair, both feet on the floor. Gently close your eyes, not tight. Sometimes in an effort to keep your eyes closed, some people tighten their eyes, but just relax. Take a deep breath in and out. And just remain aware of your body on the chair. Just feel your body on the chair. Make any adjustment that is necessary to make it relaxed. 
Feel your back on the chair, your seat on the chair, your feet on the floor. And just any part that you feel tense, just become aware. And just remain calm and aware. Take a deep breath in. Then you pay attention to your breath, the sensation of your breath as you go in and out. I'll just do it for like 30 seconds. As you breathe in, you know that you're breathing in. And as you breathe out, you know that you're breathing out. Just feel the natural, normal breath without changing anything. Remaining calm, still, and attentive. Then I'd like you to just gently open your eyes. So th that is a basic exercise that I show. Um, you do it for like five minutes. There are apps that you could download on your phone, one called Calm. Another one called Insight Timer, another one called Heads, Headspace. You could do like five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the night. Some people immediately say when I do my five minutes in the night, I instantly fall asleep. Um, the purpose is not to fall asleep yet, is to try to develop the awareness while you're awake. If it makes you sleep, it's still okay. But find these exercises, very simple but profound exercises, you'll see as you do it, it's just to check into yourself, checking the quality of your mind. Most of the people, their minds start to wander all about the place, and that is how they have been living, with a wandering mind. It's not subtle, it's always thinking, fantasizing, planning, ruminating, and what we want the mind to do is to settle, and the more it settles, it will have a calm effect on the body, that even different hormones will start to circulate when you have a balanced mind. And, and you're starting to heal yourself at a deeper level um, with more practice. So just wanted to share that. And it's a very short introduction, but there's a lot more to it. But if you just stay with the practice, even during these difficult times, you will start to build the peace that is necessary so that you can overcome. We will all overcome this. This is not going to last. It is difficult. It is challenging. The world is feeling it. But you cannot let down yourself and say you will give up. We have to hold on and we need to seek support. We need to build. Maybe COVID is teaching us uh, that we're all interrelated, that we need to build, go back to the old values of community supporting each other, people looking out for each other. This is a great lesson for us, for by uh, that COVID is also showing us we need to do things differently. We need to come out of this with different values. And if we have not learned the lesson, we go back to repeat the same destructive patterns of the past. So let us use this opportunity to care for ourselves, to care for our families, to care for others. Remember in our homes, fathers, if you are being negative to your spouse, you're affecting the children. Uh, if the mother has a child in the womb, this is a sacred time. Mothers, take care of yourselves, take care of yourselves. So this is a time for us to all take care of ourselves, physically and mentally. Thank you very much, brother. We appreciate it very much. And uh, those ideas and techniques are, are timeless. So we thank you for your being with us this morning. Thank you for having me too, Yuri. All the best. All the best to you. All right, we'll take our final break and come back and close for this morning, the 29th day of May 2020.